Well, good evening. Thanks again for joining us for our uh, Wednesday evening service. We're so thankful that you're here. Uh, we do pray that uh, many of you are signing up for our services this coming Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And you can do that on our church website. We had a great start last week to uh, have our first public regathering. And so we just look for that to grow as the weeks go along. But uh, again, we are thankful you're joining us on this platform for Wednesday nights. And we'll also continue this type of a uh, service message on uh, Sunday evenings as well. There's a song by Casting Crowns that talks about praising God in the storm. It's still one that people like to sing. Some of the most familiar lyrics are, And I'll praise you in the storm, and I will lift my hands, for you are who you are, no matter where I am, and every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You never left my side, and though my heart is torn, I will praise you in the storm. Well, over the past weeks, we've been talking about rules for crisis time, strategies for the storms, drawing upon, in part, the Red Sea Rules by Robert Morgan. Tonight, we bring this study to a close, and I pray you benefited from it, and I do hope you will purchase a copy of this little book to read and to keep in your home. In case you've not been watching or you've missed some weeks, We've been utilizing the story of the Israelites in camp by the Red Sea as recorded in Exodus 14 to talk about strategies or rules for getting through difficult circumstances like we've been going through now for several weeks. Let me recap one more time for those of you who may not have been able to, to be with us before. And so what we've learned over these past weeks is first that God is in control and He means for us to be where we are. He led the Israelites into what the author calls a cul-de-sac situation. That is, into a situation where there was no apparent way out. And He will do likewise to us. Secondly, we've learned that we're to ask the right central question when in those situations. And that is, how can God best be glorified in this situation? And the principle is, be more concerned for God's glory than for your relief. Thirdly, we're to acknowledge the enemy but keep focused upon the Lord. We looked at texts that talk about the devil in the New Testament. Their enemy was uh, the Israelites. Ours are spiritual enemies in high places. And we looked at what the Bible has to say about the enemy, but then we compared how much more the Bible talks about the Lord, about Jesus, keeping our eyes on Him as we go through the battles of life. Fourthly, we learned about praying. And we discovered about praying through the day using arrow prayers, shooting arrows to the Lord just to help us and to give us strength and wisdom and determination day by day, sufficient grace for the day. Fifthly, we've learned to stay calm and remain confident and give God time to work. Six, when unsure, take the next logical step by faith. Exodus 14, 15, God told Moses to tell the Israelites to get moving. Keep moving in faith. Seventh, we learned that we're to envision or count as real or to seek to live out the reality of the presence of God. He really, truly is with us. Eighth, we've learned to trust God to deliver in His own unique way. Every situation is different and God chooses to work through it in His own way, but He will deliver us in His time and in His way. And then last week, we talked about learning to view the current crisis that we're going through as a faith builder for the future because we'll continue to have storms and trials and cul-de-sacs in this life. Now, to talk about the tenth strategy this evening, we turn our attention to the next chapter in Exodus, chapter 15. So let's read verses 1 through 2 as we close out this series. The Bible says, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord, I will sing to the Lord, for He is highly exalted. Both horse and driver He has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank You for these weeks we've had in this study. We pray now You would bless us as we look at this last principle, this last rule uh, God, to praise you in the midst of circumstances. We just commit, Lord, the remainder of our time now to you. I pray you'd encourage every heart that's uh, tuning in and listening tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, obviously, the last thing we must not forget is that we're to learn to praise and thank God, listen, in the storm and also for His deliverance. Sometimes I think we miss the fact that God actually provides the storms for us to give us a different perspective on life. Remember we said weeks ago that part of the reason for cul-de-sacs is that God desires to develop intimacy with us. He also desires for us to come to appreciate who He is and what He has done and to look forward to what He will do. This is about building us in our relationship with Him. When our eyes are on the world, sometimes we see things from the wrong perspective and our lives are full of gloom. We hear that type of sentiment in Revelation 18, verse 10, where the world was crying, alas, alas, as they were grieving over the fall of Babylon, the idolatrous city that they had made this world. And it sounds a lot like the negativity and the gloom that has gripped our world lately as we've been going through crises and people have their eyes often on this world ultimately rather than in eternity and on that ultimate city of God. But in Revelation 19, we find another group looking at the same event. This group is comprised of the angels and the elders. And when they saw the fall of the earthly city of sin, they said, quote, After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voices of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. And continuing in verse 3, the text says, Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you His servants, you who fear Him, small and great. And then I heard... John writes what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. What a different perspective in Revelation 19, verse 1 and verses 3 through 6. Now, while our experience is not related directly to such an end-of-the-world event, we can nevertheless see from this that sometimes we're looking back on Egypt with nostalgia that is disgusting to God. We love this world, which the Bible says those who love the world ultimately can't love God. And putting us in a cul-de-sac then is God's way of turning our attention to Him, the only one who can really ultimately deliver, the only one who will give us a new heaven and new earth where everything is perfect. And so when our perspective is changed and we see the world aright, Then we can praise the Lord in the storm and as we come out of the storm. You know, Arthur Arthur talks about traveling and uh, flying around the world. And I remember the first time this happened to me as well. And he talked about having been in a city and he was getting ready to uh, fly out. And he said the, the clouds looked very ominous and stormy. He said, but when we went through them, straight up through them, he said, I remember the first time he said that... uh, He said that the storms, I realized, look really different from the upper side. And I remember that as well. Very dark and ominous, but when you got above them, man, there was the sun shining, and it just looked different from that perspective. So let me close this out tonight with a few observations about this last strategy then. So what should we do? How do we apply this? Well, first, we need in faith to learn to pray, praise, and give thanks in faith in the midst of being in the cul-de-sac. Do you remember what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.18? He said, give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Secondly, we certainly need to give God thanks and praise when He delivers us from particular cul-de-sacs for two reasons. God will bring us through And we need to remember to praise Him for two reasons. One, it's the right thing to do. Do you remember the ten lepers Jesus healed? And the text says that only one came back to thank Him and praise Him. And Jesus took notice of it. The Bible says in Luke 17, verses 16 through 18, that um, one of the men came and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving Him thanks. And the text says, now he was a Samaritan. 
And then Jesus answered, We're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? You know, there is something striking to me about this text. Not only that the Samaritan came back and gave thanks, and Jesus was uh, um, touched by that and, su and surprised in his humanity at the others. Where are they? But listen, do you think that this one who came back to thank him had a relationship that would predispose his future prayers being heard favorably by Jesus? Our author shares a story about a friend of his who has several grandchildren. He said he sends his grandchildren cards with money on their birthdays. And he says each year, he said, every one of them sends back a card with a thank you except one, one girl. And he said, she's a dear girl, but she never gets around to thanking me for my gift. And he said, it leaves him a little sad and disappointed. And listen, he said, I'm less eager to do things for her in the future. So we should give thanks because it's the right thing to do. And it will also remind us of his faithfulness. It will burn the memory upon our souls when we learn to give heartfelt thanks and praise to God. Thirdly, there are many different ways to learn to be a person who praises the Lord. We should seek to make it a discipline in daily prayers. And make sure you include a time of thanksgiving in your prayers. You remember the song, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One. And tell others also what God has done for you. Testify to His faithfulness and His greatness to others. Another way we can learn to praise Him in the storm is to sing to the Lord. You know, you ought to have a hymnal in your home that you can draw upon and use. You know, some of the greatest hymns we have were written by people who were in or who were coming out of cul-de-sacs, and they can speak to our soul. One such hymn is by a man named Martin Rinkert, a German Lutheran pastor who lived from 1586 to 1649. He was born the son of a poor coppersmith, and he began his ministry during the difficult and bloody times of the Thirty Years' War, as floods of refugees were pouring into the walled city uh, where he served. And people around him were dying from plague and famine. He was officiating, listen to this, as many as 50 funerals a day. As many people were dying. Can you imagine that? And can you think of the emotional strain he must have been under? And the enemies of the people, ultimately, who were taking refuge, they demanded a huge ransom to end the hostilities. And when that happened, Rinkert left the safety of the walled city. He went through the gates and went out to negotiate with the enemy. And through his courage and faith, the hostilities ended. And from that experience, he wrote the great hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. And in part, it says, Now Thank We All Our God, with heart and hands and voices. Isn't that great? With every part of our physical being and with our soul. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices, who wondrous things hath done, in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms hath blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love, and still is ours today. And then also journal, if you're a journaler, your thanks to God. Or relate your deliverance to a particular scripture that you can recall about God's faithfulness when you were going through a storm and Make that a, a foundational principle scripture in your life that you go to often to remember the faithfulness of God and the, the Word of God, the rock of the God upon which you will stand. And so we can learn to praise God then if we'll approach it in this way on whichever side of the clouds we happen to be at at the moment. If we truly believe that He's the Lord over the storms and the universe and that He'll always be faithful to us, we can then rest in His incredible hands and give praise. Father, we thank You for being who You are. And Lord, You know the struggles we go through and the tears we cry. And we thank You, Lord, that You hold all of those. And we praise You and thank You that You are the Lord over our storms. We know that You see everything. You rule over everything. God, help us to have faith in you that when we're looking from below at the clouds that are so dark and we feel like we're in a tremendous storm, that we can praise you in the storm. And then, Lord, also to praise you when we are delivered 
and in that to find, Lord, a growing rela relationship with you of trust. And Lord, that through that we will be strengthened for the next storm that will come as you continue to introduce these things into our lives. Lord, to turn our attention from this world that is dying and passing away. And Lord, to help our Lord um, idols to be slayed, that we might more fully focus upon you, worship you, love you, that we, God, might ultimately be transformed to be like you in our character. I thank you, Lord, for this study, and I just pray, Lord, that uh, through it, you, Lord, will not only have encouraged uh, our hearts, but uh, strengthened our faith and given us resolve to continue to walk faithfully with you. Lord, as long as you leave us here until you call us home, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.